Welcome back to part two of a roughly 60 minute conversation delivering what we call advisor shortcuts, growth hacks to your next 100 million AUM. I'm your host, Matt Delzingawa, or Delzy for short. I can't thank you enough for your time. By the way, if you did happen to miss part one of this uh, series, you can go to my YouTube channel, Coffee with Delzy, put in Botsford. And you'll be able to view the first interview, which got rave reviews, not because of me, but because of our guest. But it was a fantastic success. Erin shared with us her techniques of closing any size prospect anywhere, anytime, in just one appointment. And it was absolutely invaluable, the things that she shared. So let me introduce our speaker again. She's an advisor, author, and trainer known as the Advisor Authority. Erin is a CFP. She was a 31-year veteran of the profession. She was a Barron's Top 100 and in all categories. That's advisor, independent, and women. Erin successfully sold her billion-dollar practice in 2017 and provides advisors the ability to model her success through the Elite Advisor Success System training program. So it's not a coaching program, folks. It's, an, it's a modeling system which is amazing. And I'm going to go through some statistics in a minute. The thing that drives her every day is the fact that most of her profits are donated to a in Livingston, Zambia, which is in Africa. She supports 800 orphans through the Ebenezer Foundation, where they provide education, food and shelter, and trying to give these kids a life, right? Compliments to to Erin and all of her efforts and what she's doing with the those kids out in, in on Livingston. So thank you, Aaron, for that. Aaron, welcome back to the show. Thanks, Delzy. Glad to be here. All right. We appreciate your time as well. And Mike and Blake, thank you guys for being here. Today is about prospecting high net worth clients, but it's not just about prospecting. You got to understand it's about mindset because many of my advisors just don't believe that they can go up market, if you will, go to the two and a half, five million, $10 million AUM clients. And it's a shame because I know how good you are. And Erin's going to help you change that mindset and how it changed her as well. So that's the first part. So as I'm asking Erin questions, I want you to pepper her in the Q&A box, your own questions, because the second half of the call, it's not about me, folks. I know I'm this pretty face up here and everyone wants to look. <laughs> Just kidding. And I'm going to share with a couple of statistics before we get into the questions. 75% of the, the students that join Erin's system are closing faster by 28%, which means that they're doing it in one less meeting to close a high net worth client, which means if you do that monetarily, if you're charging $250, $500 an hour and you're in your head, well, guess what? That's a lot of money saved and time and effort, right? Awesome results. 82% of the students have increased their net new assets per client by 84% within the first six to nine months, which is incredible. The average advisor going into the system, we're roughly around a half a million dollars in new assets. After the system, they're averaging just over a million dollars per client. And this one blows me away. 69% of the students going into the system do not charge any fees, no planning fees whatsoever. After coming out of the system, 83% are now charging fees. If that's not a change in mindset, I don't know what is, folks. So that's called results. And Erin has, has proven it time and time again over the last seven years with 1,400 advisors. And so that's why it's so important. This is why we hired Erin to share some of these insights with you guys. So with that, Erin, we're going to talk about mindset. So my first question is, like the Field of Dreams where they said, if you build it, they will come, right, with Kevin Costner. So when the advisor is ready, the prospects will show. Why do you believe that so strongly? I, I didn't know it until I started teaching advisors. And so that now I know it to be true. So so many advisors, they come to me and they say, hey, Aaron, we heard you were you used to work with high net worth prospects and all this stuff. And I'm like, yeah. Can you help me find, can you help me move up market? When, can, can you help me work with higher net worth people? I'm like, of course I can. But I always say, what if I put you in front of a room, there's 50 prospects that all had, were worth 50 million or more. Would you have any idea what to say to them? And usually the answer is no. So I think a lot of times in our industry, we put the cart before the horse. And that's why I always start, I train people to be ready when they get that opportunity. Because really what it takes is not, it takes skills and skills will bring you confidence. And so what we have found in practice is that once advisors, they can walk in and they know the exact words to say, the next thing to say, 
They're never caught off guard. They literally walk in a, into a room and they become a prospect magnet, right? They have this new confidence, this aura about them and people are drawn to them. And I experienced that in my practice, but I didn't really know. I wasn't sure if that would be the result as I started training people. And the answer is yes, it is. And yes, when the advisor is ready to deal with and knows what to say to those high net worth prospects, they will appear. And Delzi, you and I have talked about this before. What's really fun is that you only have to get one. You only have to be prepared for one because why, Delzi? Birds of a feather flock together. You know, and, yeah, that, and, so and that was one of my questions uh, that was going to come up and you just brought it up is, are why is high network clients a lot easier eventually once you get in to start oh. prospecting and working with? Oh, I can't even tell you. It's, it's just so nice because the guy that the higher net worth prospects, they, first of all, they have a lot of needs. They care. They typically care about a lot of people. They're so much easier to deal with. So a 20% decline in the market. Okay, whatever. It's the lower end clients that are always, oh my gosh, they're going to run out of money. And they're, of course, that's what you do to protect them to not run out of money, put them in annuities, but they're always limited. They, and they've got these, and they usually think a little bit smaller. And so it's just fun to deal with higher net worth prospects and they care about their mom, their dad, their brothers or sisters. We do long-term care on everybody. You, they buy life insurance on their adult children because their adult children are working really hard but can't afford life insurance. You know, I mean, they just have a lot of needs. And so just one relationship can feed, it can feed you for a long time. So you don't yeah. need a lot of them either. And it's though, Delzi, I will say this. It's a difference between Walmart and Neiman Marcus. Both Walmart and Neiman Marcus those businesses make money, but it's a lot more fun to go and drink champagne in Neiman Marcus than it is to fight the crowds in Walmart. I'm just saying. No, that's a great analogy. And I love this part of the mindset of the advisor because this was your turning point, if you will, with Paul. So I, cause I, I think that was it. So if you could share that, that one day when you met Paul and yeah. you were like, wait, I can do Right. Yeah. Share that real quick. Yeah, real quick. For those of you who are not on the last call, I was actually a struggling advisor for the first 10 years, badly struggling, taking a bunch of clients I shouldn't have taken, but I didn't know any different. And so I decided to quit. And I went to my branch manager, said, I'm done. I'm just going to go get a job. It's a lot. This That would be a lot easier. He goes, oh, Aaron, don't do that. Go get some business coaching. So I enrolled in a coaching program and I thought, okay, I'm going to give this one more shot. I'm going to give it everything I've got. And so three years later, our coach says, hey, everybody, you've been here now 12 times, stand up, find somebody in class and share your results with them. So I stood up, I saw this random guy standing there. I said, hey, do you want to do the exercise together? He goes, sure. His name happened to be Paul. So I was really excited. I went first. I said, hey, I'm Aaron Bosford. I'm from Dallas, Texas. I was doing around three years ago, I was doing around $300,000 in production. Now I'm on target to do between 400 and 450. And Delzi, I'm thinking to myself like, look at me. I was so excited. And then it was Paul's turn. He's in the financial services business as well. He said, yeah, three years ago, I was doing 300,000 as well. And he goes, this year I'm on target to do 3 million in production. And he said, I don't meet with any of my existing clients anymore. All I do is I go out and find, I share the philosophy of my firm. I, I basically turn every client over to licensed members of my team. And I take a lot of time off. And I was like, what did you just say? You, did you say you went to 300,000 to 3 million in three years? He goes, yep. And by the way, we were almost exactly the same age at the time. So I'm looking at him like, and you don't do all your client review meetings and you don't meet with, nope, I, I built a business. In fact, he, I don't know if I told you this on the last one, to add insult to injury, he said, oh yeah, and by the way, my wife just won the Bill Phillips Body for Life contest. So I'm in the process of building a gym. So next year I will own a financial services company and I will own a gym. And I was yeah. like, oh my God, of course the bell rings, time to go back to our desk. And I was just, I was like stammering, stuttering. I, I couldn't believe it. And I said, Paul, can, could I just buy a few hours of your time? And fortunately for me, he said, yeah, why don't you come spend the day with me and my team? So as quickly as I could get back to Texas, I made my husband come with me because I just knew there was going to be this big cost to getting success like that. And I wanted my husband to understand if we had to get a divorce, maybe that was worth it. We had to sell our firstborn child. Okay. But it wasn't like that at all. And just spending one day with somebody who was doing what I think about is Delzi. I always say what was doing what I wanted to do. I didn't even know that was possible. But once I saw it was possible, I thought, 
he doesn't look any better looking than me. He doesn't seem any smarter than me. Why can't I do that? So sure enough, I came back three years later. I did three million, then four million, five million. The business just kept growing from there. And I ended up with two offices, one in Dallas, one in Atlanta. I had seven conference rooms consistently filled with clients of my firm, and I wasn't in any one of them. And what's really interesting, you always talk to me about mindset because you know I'm really big on that. Paul told me to go home and he gave me a list of goals to write and all stuff. And I wrote, I want to have two offices. I want to have seven conference rooms filled with clients of my firm. And now I realize, geez, was I thinking too small? I should have said I want 20 offices, 100 conference rooms, because what I've learned then over the last 20 years is that your brain actually has to stay consistent with itself. Your brain has to it has to go find that. And, and it creates the, the, the pathway to get there. So what I have found in training now, over a thousand advisors, 13 or 1400, Gosh, we think small, yeah. really small. Yeah. It's and a mindset thing, right? That's really what it comes down to. And it's amazing. So in my travels, I meet with my advisors and you could probably tell I lead with value, right? Practice management, try to get a, an idea of their practice. And are you in growth mode? Are you in maintain mode? And most of my advisors are still in growth mode. And I say, hey, tell me a little bit about your client acquisition strategy. And they look at me like I have two heads, like, I get referrals. That's the number one way. Okay, great. Are you proactive or reactive? And most of them are reactive, right? So today, what you and I are going to share is like, what are some of your favorite prospecting methods or avenues? Because you in your trainings talk about, you got to have multiple avenues. You can't just focus on one thing. And I always ask my advisors, what are you doing to market or prospect. And they're like, oh, we send out a monthly newsletter. We have one kind of appreciation a year. I might go to lunch with one or a referral a month. And I'm just like, oh my gosh, if they were just to get under Erin and see what she's doing and why you always had a pipeline and multiple avenues doing that. Why do advisors always lump prospecting and marketing into one category? What's the difference? Marketing can be outsourced. You can hire companies to do your newsletter and send out your emails and create your, your client appreciation events and put it together so you just show up. But prospecting and hunting has to be done by the advisor. Because it, it, it's we are at a people business. It's a people in a person business. And I don't believe that you can outsource that function. And think about this, Delzy. A lot of advisors say, I want to hire somebody who can go out and hunt for me. And I'm always like, look, good luck with that. Because if they can hunt for you, why wouldn't they just hunt for themselves? Why, why should you make all the money and you pay them a salary to go hunt? Hunting is the hardest, hunting and prospecting is the hardest function of our job, which is why so such a high percentage of advisors fail out of the business. And leading into, yes, I teach 10 different ways to prospect for your next client, hopefully your ideal client. That's another thing, Delzi, I find fascinating. Most advisors, if I said, Tell me exactly what your ideal client looks like. They would not be able to tell me. What, how old is he? How, what's his net worth? What does he do for a living? Where does he hang out? They have no idea because they just haven't dialed down into, we call them personas. And so I try and get advisors to come up with a maximum of three different personas. One might be senior level executives of Fortune 500 companies. One might be small business owners. One might be widows and divorcees. I don't know. Those are three different and then find out exactly what those people look like. And the reason you want to do that is you can avoid doing things where those people are never going to show up, right? They're never going to be there. So I think a lot of advisors, because they really haven't dialed down into who their ideal prospect is, they run around like chickens with their head cut off, hoping that, hope is not a strategy, by the way, but hoping that ideal prospect is going to show up at their event. High net worth prospects typically don't go to seminars, for instance. And so the other thing I teach, Delzi, is that I always think you have to have a minimum of three different types of prospecting efforts going on all at one time. And why is that? It's because prospects get to decide how they engage with you. You don't get to decide that. So some want to see you from a distance. They might want to attend a webinar, check you out, or a seminar or whatever. Some want to be referred into by an existing client. And other people want to maybe be referred in by uh, a COI. So there's, you, and if you miss some of the various different ways of prospecting, you you could miss an entire population and be, because they get to decide how they want to engage with you. 
So I teach 10 ways and I was like, pick three of the 10 ways and start working on that. So it, it, again, I hate to use the mind, but I'm sorry if I'm so redundant with this mindset thing, but really when you're mapping out a client and you're developing the mindset of saying, okay, where does that person hang out with? Now your marketing efforts, your prospecting efforts, now dive into just that category of where are they hanging out, right? right? And where can I put myself in the best position? So walk me through or walk us through, I should say, one of your, no, I don't, I, you said this, you corrected me the other day. You said, Delzi, I don't have a favorite prospecting method because my favorite is not the, uh, maybe another advisor, right? You love seminars because you love being in front of the audience. Well, I have advisors who are scared to death to be in front of an audience, right? And there's nothing wrong with that. So that's not their personality. So can you share with one of your, one, one that you like? I love the lunch bunch. That's one of my favorites. If you could share with how you use the lunch bunch, your story of being in 17 different cities in like 19 years, because your husband was an airline pilot, was in the military, and you were constantly reselling yourself, if you will, to a new market every year, essentially. <laughs> a lot. Yeah. Yeah. So this out to lunch bunch, when I talk about it, advisors think, I can't believe like she did that. And she going out to lunch with people, you can find your ideal prospects or turn that into something. But here's the deal, Delzy. It's not just lunch. This is intentional prospecting. And it's what a lot of advisors refuse to do. They don't want to do it. So I, I name all of my prospecting methods I name. This one we call Out to Lunch Bunch. So started <laughs> off, I just moved, as Delzy said, one time to Plano, Texas in the late 80s, early 90s. And I didn't know one soul. And this young girl, and I, <laughs> I did not know one soul outside my husband. I walked into the Chamber of Commerce and I took a, the girl behind the desk out to lunch. She was clearly not qualified to be my prospect. She was probably younger than me. Da, da, da. But I had been... I've been, I'm an avid reader, especially in business books and stuff. And I've been reading a book about the law of reciprocity, which means if I give you something, Delzy, something of value, let's say I send you a birthday cake, you feel inclined to give me something back. It's just our society, our culture is that way. So what I, after reading this book, I decided to try it out. And so the the concept is, Intentionally at this lunch, I was, you compliment and most importantly, ask questions. And it's not to have a dialogue with, I'm going to, and Adelza, you and I dialogue back and forth all the time because I'm not trying to sell you on anything, right? Yeah. But if I were, right now, we would be talking the Matt Delzy story. Matt, where, where were you born and raised? What do you do for fun? And it would be all about you. And if you ever asked me a question, I go, oh, you know what? Yeah, I, I like to ski, but so let's get back to you. So you, it's so intentionally focused on the other person. If they do manage at the lunch to ask anything about you, you give them one word answers and you direct it right back to them, okay? And the reason, again, you want to engage this law of reciprocity. So with this girl, Rome Wynn, who was my first prospect, I was like, let me just back up and say, why does this so effective? And the answer is this, Delzy, when is the last time somebody took you to lunch, dinner, or having a glass of wine and gave you the opportunity to spend one entire hour talking all about you? When was the last time that happened? I don't remember. <laughs> it's, it, it's, it never happens because right. we have conversations and we give and see if you're just having a conversation, it's a give and take. I gave you something, you gave me something back. I gave you something you gave. So there's nothing required at the end yeah. because we, our law of reciprocity was taken care of in the lunch. But if I keep pummeling you and take a, a clear and abiding interest in you, and I'm talking about true interest, not this fake stuff. At the end, Delzi, you have to give me something. And guess what? I get to decide what it's going to be. Blake, if you can find the, uh, there's five, I've figured out there's five, possible outcomes from these lunch bunch. Can you get to that slide? Okay. So the five possible outcomes, and I'll embellish a couple of them, is one, you get to, if they're qualified, the, obviously, if you happen to go with somebody, they happen to be qualified to be your client, ask for the appointment. And the thing about it is, Delzy, most of my career, I was, I always had lunch with one person. 
But you also know that I never talk about my business or give my approach talk to one person if there are two people that will be affected by the planning. So I, I belong to the Dallas Chamber of Commerce. I belong to Women's Executive Women's Roundtable, International Women's uh, Forum. So I would ask women or men, I would ask them out to lunch. I was never going to talk about my business because I need both of those people in front of me if I'm going to talk about my business and sell them. Oh. So in this case, they're qualified. Hey, because at the end, they're like, geez, Aaron, I feel so bad. I've done all the talking. I have no problem. I said, you know what? I'll tell you all about myself. Next time, let's get together. I'd love to meet your wife or your husband. Let's get together at my office and I'll tell you all about what we do. The next one is asked to be introduced to others via mutual introduction. So this girl, Rome, worked for the Dallas Chamber. Her, her reaction was the same. Jeez, Aaron, all I've done is talk about myself. Tell me a little bit about you. Time's up. You haven't had a chance to. But where you could really help me out is, can you tell me like, I'm new in town. Who are the movers and the shakers? Who are the people I need to get to know here? She says, oh my God, you need to know Bob the banker. You need to know Joe the attorney. You need to know this person. Would you mind setting up a mutual introduction? No, of course I will. My time with you has been so great. Of course I will. And I teach about exactly the words to follow up and all of that. Maybe they are in a club organization, a sorority, a fraternity, and they you find out that I'm in this fraternity. Yeah, we have monthly speakers. Hey, would you introduce me to the person who books your speakers? I'd love to talk to your group. You can ask to be written about in a local publication. I'll tell you more about that in a minute. Of course, you can say, hey, from time to time, I give seminars or I have speakers. I invite speakers on relevant topics to the market. Would you like to be invited? Of course I would. And again, the other one is they might not be qualified themselves, but they might work for somebody else who is. So I'll give you the two examples on this. Do you want me to do that, Delzy? Yeah, absolutely. Because I love how what you're doing is you're leveraging. It's like a foundation and you just keep mm -hmm. building on it into different spider webs like, and just capturing more and more people. So yeah, continue. And again, this does not work if you go to lunch and have a conversation. It does not, that does not create the law of reciprocity. You must not do that. It's a waste of time. Okay. I don't know if it's a waste of time. There's interesting people, but you will yeah, get right. what you want. So the two outcomes that I'd like to share is, are fun. I have an office in Dallas. I lived in Dallas. I spent 13 years traveling to my office in Atlanta. And I finally in 2008 said, I'm done. I can't do this. It's just too much. I'm not coming back. So I was really, once again, after 13 years, starting over in Dallas. And I thought to myself, okay, what are some of the things I could do to help me really become noticed in Dallas again? And I thought, well, you know what? It'd be really cool to be, have a, an article written about me in the Dallas Morning News, biggest paper there. Just so happened, I did this walkathon. And this lady said, oh yeah, I know the business writer for the Dallas Morning News. I'm like, okay, can you make an introduction? I she said, yeah, I took this woman to lunch. What do you think I did with this woman? She was the business writer. You hammered questions on her career. <laughs> Who are the most interesting people you you've go. ever interviewed? I found out she had one daughter. She said, thought the son Rosen said on her daughter. She loved to travel. They went to England every year. They had a place in Hawaii. Da, 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 da. And the interesting thing about that particular lunch, Delzy, was it was one of the few where she actually never reciprocated she never tried to ask me anything about me because she was you think and but but for an in honesty for her she'd always been the interviewer how fun for her to be the one talking about themselves right now i didn't realize that at the time but the funniest part about the whole lunch is at the end <laughs> she said erin i've enjoyed our lunch so much she goes you're probably one of the most interesting people i've ever met would you mind would you consider if i wrote a story about you sure <laughs> That would be great. She did not know one thing about me because she didn't ask, but that's how powerful it was. The second one I'll talk about was the other thing was they might not be qualified, but they know somebody is. So I, again, I did seminars. At one point I was doing six seminars a month for a lot of years. And, um, but this happened to be, I did a seminar and this woman came and um, I found out that she was the bookkeeper for a very famous Dallas cowboy. So famous that everybody here would know. Anyway, so I asked her to lunch and I knew she probably thought the only reason I was asking her to lunch was for an introduction to this person. Instead, I focused on her, the woman sitting next to me and she was quite large. So I assumed she liked to eat. I asked her a lot, where are your favorite restaurants? I was grasping at straws. What do we talk about with this person? But I never, ever once asked about her boss. Where do you like to vacation? What do you do? What other people do you work for in terms of bookkeeping? I just focused all on her. And at the end, and like I said, I kid you not, I'm not telling, making up. She said, you know what? 
I really think my boss, I'm going to say the names, Joe and Pat could really use your services. I'd like to set up a meeting with Joe and Pat. And I'm like, okay. So I went home and I told my husband, I go, when I said the name, I go, she's setting up a meeting with Joe, Joe so-and-so. And my husband's like, what? And so I get to his office. It was a week later. And again, there's only two or three of the most famous Dallas Cowboys. So just pick one. And I knew I walked in and here I'm a seasoned professional. I've been in the business a long time. I knew my stuff, but still Delzy, I was sitting in the car going, I cannot believe I'm walking to this person's office. I just, so don't think that I don't fake it till I make it half the time. So I walked in thinking it'll be cool to see his office. I knew he was covered up with advisors and everybody wanted a piece of him. And so I thought it'd be fun. I'll be probably back in the car in 15 minutes. And two and a half hours later, I came away with a new client. And then he sent me a lot of other of his friends because that's just the way it works. I was prepared. I, was I nervous? You bet I was, but I was prepared and I got a new client. So again, I never had lunch with him, but I had lunch with his bookkeeper and that's how I ended up with him. Hold on. We're going to stop right here. We're going to let Blake and, uh, and, and Mike come on for a few minutes to talk about the program because that's, I know what a lot of advisors are thinking. And by the way, guys, I want to see some more questions. We've had a few, but I want to see more that you're going to be asking. But because it, when they hear seminar, people just get agile, right? They're just like, oh, it's a seminar. Are you kidding me? So your seminars weren't like the traditional plate liquor seminars, right? You were being a part of other programs. So we'll get into that after Mike and Blake jump in and, and, and share some of the success and, and what the program is. All right. I will. I'm going to go off camera so they can focus on Mike and Blake. Okay, great. So we're just going to jump in real quick because I know you guys are, are trying to get as much value out of this call as you possibly can. But we did have an opportunity we wanted to open this up to because a lot of the advisors on the call today have either attended other free trainings of ours or other uh, trainers and coaches out there. Some of you, because we've been doing some research, have taken other coaches and other training programs. So here's what we have. We looked at putting this all together for you guys in what would be like the Elite Advisor Success System. And I'm going to talk about that. These are the most common roadblocks you guys present to us. You're stuck in your level of production. You're trying to figure out, oh, how do I break that threshold? How, if you've reached a million, how do you stay there? How do you reach two? If you've reached 500, how do you reach a million? You want to move up market, get in front of those high net worth clients Aaron was talking about just a few minutes ago. Where are they? How do I get to them? You may be afraid if you get in front of that $40 million client, you wouldn't know what to say because they're looking at the uh, whole idea of working with an advisor from a totally different place. They don't need a money manager. They need something different. And you want to grow the business, and you but you lack an organizational system. You're not sure what the repeatable steps and the processes need to look like for you to confidently, predictably grow that business, right? And there just aren't enough hours in the day to complete all the things because you're wearing all the hats. We hear that a lot. So this program is definitely for you if you're one of three, and one of you is. If you are a brand new advisor, let's say the first five years, and you're looking to just really create some momentum, we've got a great program for you because you'll go through all the sales training we talked about in that first call. And then all the prospecting methods we're talking about today. If you're an established advisor and you're ready to cross that million dollar threshold and keep going, this is definitely for you because now it's just about fine tuning a few things and then leveraging a team and starting to really replicate the process and leverage all of that. And then if you're a veteran advisor who's got a team, got a business, you've got a really good thing going, you just got to get out of the room. This is an excellent training program for you because it will give you all the tools you need to empower the team, not just enable them, empower them to take the big action steps you need. So Mike, this exclusive opportunity, what is this all about? Yeah, thanks. Thanks, Mike. So working with Delzi and his group, guys, the reason Delzi invited you here, of course, is to hear from Erin and learn some of her what we'll call best practices in the business. And now she's teaching you her entire playbook about that. That's what the training program really is. It's called the Elite Advisor Success System. It really is 30 years of Aaron Botsford condensed down into an online training platform that you can cover in a six-month period of time. So Blake, if you want to move forward, we'll talk a little bit about what that program is. But you'll basically follow everything and model everything she did in the business like Blake just said, from bringing in the prospect, how do you get in front of them to how did you close them? How did you build a team around you? How did you do this so you could take time off from your business 
and not, the wheels not fall off your business. <laughs> we were talking to an advisor yesterday. They're going to go to Mexico, he and his wife, but they're going to take their laptops for a week because they can't let it go. But how do you learn to build a self-sustaining business? That's what Aaron will teach you in this training program. But here's the thing you want to think about. We just did our stats from last year. How did our students do using Aaron's program in their business? But I'm going to give you a little what I'll call ROI exercise. Let's say you're a producer that produces around $300,000 of production. Now, you're going to find out later our average student is about three times that, at least 2.5 times that average production. But let's say Aaron's program only helped you gain an additional 10% of growth this year. That would be an additional $30,000 to your bottom line. Wouldn't that be neat if she helped you grow just 10% more this year? Really good news, guys. Our stats are well above that. In fact, if you're looking to move up market and take on bigger ticket clients, 84% increase in our average new client AUM last year. Guys, We, if your typical client was, I think our average was around $575,000 client, we're now getting over a million dollar AUM ticket clients. So again, if you said, I want to move up market, I want to have million dollar clients, that's exactly what the program did. And we had last year, again, an 84% increase in the AUM ticket size. And not only that, if you are an advisor that's been thinking about how do I add other revenue streams to my portfolio? Well, 83% are now charging financial planning fees and Aaron's program teaches you how to do that, even if you've never charged before. And in fact, vast majority, nearly 70% of advisors come to us without ever charging a fee. And we turn that completely around for you and teach you how to put, produce that. But without that, you can get right now, some of you are fast starters and you're saying, geez, how do I get more information on the program? We have a website built for you. It's aaronbotsford.com slash brighthouse. So we have a special program for you. But what we also want to do is bring you special pricing. Because being part of Matt's group here, he's bringing this to you. And, he, and because of our relationship with him, basically our program could be around a $30,000 training program. In fact, when you add up all the elements in the portfolio, I'm going to show you what that is in a second. We should easily be charging $30,000 for the training. But on the website, our whole training platform is a $10,000 investment. So if you go there right now, that's what you'll see on the website. But if you go to our special webpage, we've actually, because of your association here today on the webinar, and the training, we are actually going to lower that down to $39.99 or 60% off by being part of this Delzi call today. So again, we are lowering the price because Aaron does not want price to be the reason you don't invest back in your education, invest in your business. So again, you're going to go to this website. This is a special page on the website. So don't go to AaronBotsford.com. Make sure you put slash Bright House. And I'm going to show you what that page looks like in just a second. So that's really, again, the pricing it's an online platform. I'm going to show you what that is. In fact, why don't I do that right now, Blake, or do you have some more you want to share there? Okay. No, you want to go ahead and share what that looks Can like so they know how to sign oh, in? I don't have sharing. <laughs> sorry. Can I? Sorry about that. Can I share a little bit real quick about what it looks like and how those enroll? And then we're going, we're going to, those who have questions, guys, start putting those in the Q&A box. What type of questions do you have for Erin? What can she help you with today? So you can get a glimpse of what it's like to work with Erin over the next six months. So again, our training platform is an online portal. You'll log in and go through coursework. And then after the coursework, it, again, it's all divided into pieces. Every week, you're going to go through something new. Again, you're going to model Aaron's business over the next six months and be invited to live monthly group coaching calls with Aaron and the other mastermind students. So think about it. Can you imagine then getting your questions answered or hurdles mastered? Like Blake said, we had these frustrations or these five or six different things that advisors typically have. We help you bust through those in a very short amount of time. That's why our advisors are having such crazy results because you're basically modeling instead of what we call traditional coaching. I was going to show you real quick. Can I still do that? Yep. Oh yeah, there we go. Yep. Okay, real quick guys, I'm going to show you what it looks like as a student. This is the student online portal. And what you'll do is you'll log in 24 seven. This could be from any time of day or night you want to log in. It's an online protect, password protected portal. Uh, and basically you can go through the material on any device again, anytime. Each one of these is a series of information and coursework as, as um, Delzi was saying, not only did Aaron help you in the in the salesmanship course, the one we did last time, which was Secret Sauce, we're now talking about prospecting and marketing. And there's a whole course on that. We have those monthly calls that you'll be recording. We also have courses for your assistant, building your team, and of course, that mindset of achievement that we started talking about today. How, do, how can Aaron help duplicate that for you and your business? So basically, that's what the online course looks like. I can delve in deeper in just a little bit, but I do want to show you the special webpage we built again. AaronBotsford.com slash Brighthouse. And what you'll see if you scroll down, you'll be able to also do a couple things. 
uh, on this page, one is you'll be able to download Erin's book. She wants to go ahead and give you a copy of her digital book, Seven Figure Firm. You can do that here. All right. Well, thank you guys for doing that. I appreciate it. So let's get back to Erin and some of the things that she was sharing with leveraging these luncheons and then leveraging them into speaking and seminars. Erin, could you share some of your thoughts of how you use those out the lunch bunch to find seminar opportunities, if you will, or speaking engagements. I didn't, like I said, I didn't always use out to lunch bunch. I created a database and stuff like that. And I invited people again. I did six seminars a month. I think the big thing is, is how I got people to the seminars. And then what I talked about, Delsey, that I teach on these things called disturbing tracks, right? I have 22 different places to go. And because people, Delzi, are not moved by information. They don't care what your manager selection process is. They don't, and truthfully, they don't care about money management at all. What advisors fail to realize is that most people, especially people that have any wealth at all, their number one concern is not losing it. And so I know Allianz did a study of women. Do you realize that 57% of women of means fear that someday they'll end up becoming a bag lady. So we're at most, and this is why I was very successful. All my competitors were comparing money manager stats. And I was talking about okay, the risk side of the balance sheet. Let's talk about, you, I heard you have a, a son or daughter that's away at college. Are they driving a car in your name? What happens if they get in a car accident and they, they hit a plastic surgeon? Are you prepared for a $25 million lawsuit? Are you prepared to lo lo lose everything that you've ever worked for so tell me how your assets are titled. So I worked on the risk side of the balance sheet. So my seminars were conducive to that. In other words, right now, the seminar I might be giving is with the markets at all time high, what happens next? Hmm. And then you put some dialogue and we've created this for our, our students or another seminar title might be what could possibly go wrong? Okay. Everybody wants to know, even to this day, sometimes I'm like, okay, do Bob and I have everything locked down? We're wealthy. I don't want somebody falling in my driveway to be able to sue me and take all my net worth. So higher net worth people are more concerned about their downside. They've already made their money. All the great money management in the world that you can offer them is nothing if they're being sued because somebody got hurt on their property and they didn't have their the titling of their house. They didn't have enough umbrella liability insurance. They weren't locked down. If you want to appeal to people, appeal to where their heads are, not to where you want their heads to be. They don't care about your money management. It's a, the hammer and the nail, right? I just want, I want my picture hung. You're telling me, you're telling me what kind of hammer you're going to give me to hang my picture. So it's just faulty thinking. And that's why people are not successful in seminars and converting people because they're talking about the wrong stuff. And it's just, like I said, today, right now, especially with the market being all-time highs, some days I wish I, I should just go back to the business because I'd be cleaning up right now. Everybody's worried what happens next. Geez, the Dow's at whatever. What happens next? And am I missing anything? Is there some downside I should be thinking about? And I'm getting ready to retire in June. And what if the market dropped by 50%? What happens to me then? And that's people all, especially wealthier people, they're the most risk averse. So yeah. to talk to them that you're going to magically make them money is the wrong topic. Yeah. I, I love this. Hey, there's a little hint for the next seminar or call is maybe what you would be doing as an advisor in terms of protection strategies with markets at all time highs and what you would be talking to your high net worth clients about. So that's an awesome idea. Thank you for sharing that. So I, I, we're getting a couple of questions in here. One is, Aaron, how did you prepare for that meeting with that Dallas Cowboy? Like, well, I, didn't, your, I, didn't, I didn't prepare you didn't that prepare day. anything? No, I didn't prepare that day. I knew my stuff. I'd been preparing for 15 years. So I knew exactly where to go. When he said this, I said this. When he said that, I was just a little intimidated by the name, right? I was so prepared. And that's what I teach my advisor students how to do. I'll give you an example. We had an advisor, his name's Dustin. I think he was, I don't know if he's on your call last time or not, but he started a year ago in our program. He said within a week of starting the program, he had this opportunity to get in front of a $40 million guy. 40 million. He said, Aaron, I've never even had that opportunity before. And he said, but I, he had the silver bullet. He goes, I stayed home all the weekend before I scheduled the meeting on Monday. 
and I listened to your I, my unscripted approach talk, and he, I memorized the disturbing tracks. I went in there, and he said, the guy, when I was done disturbing him, the guy goes, okay, what's it going to take to fix all this? And he said, I could hear your voice in the back of my head. And I said, okay, if you're with a $40 million guy, say the biggest number that can come out of your mouth. And he said, okay, my annual financial planning fee is going to be $44,500. The guy goes, done. That has completely transformed his business. And he, he, but he was prepared. Now he was probably a little shakier than I would have been, yeah. but it was all there. It's just memorization. That's yeah. all it is, memorization. I love when you share your training, like you always have two disturbing tracks in your pocket for any demographic, whether you know anything about them or not. And as you're like at a seminar in or in a, and also you could tie this in is the three by five cards that you always had three or four disturbing tracks and you were ready to speak at any, you had to drop a hat when someone said, Hey, our speaker just canceled. Can you come over and speak about this? And you just looked at the room and go, all right, these are my disturbing tracks I'm talking about now. Like, how important is that? Because I think all of this can be summed up by if you just knew the disturbing tracks, you could be unstoppable is what I've learned. Yeah, that's it. And what's nice is that I, there's so few people that know that. Know that. We've yeah. got train, but between 1,300 and 1,400. I used to love, I, I loved being in competitive situations. I was always in competitive situations. And I was just like, let's wait for these guys to just pull out their calendar, pitch deck, calendar charts, talk about their manager selection process. And I'm like, oh my gosh, really? What year is this? And I was just going, bam, done. Thank you very much. Because it was such a different approach. And I will say this, Matt, while I was doing it, I didn't, I knew it was different because I kept hearing the same all over here, but I didn't know how different it was. And until now, training advisors, they're like, oh my God, I would have never thought of that or whatever. So that's been fun. That's awesome. So the, the, I'm, I'm going to go back to a couple more questions. I understand how you, he, he goes, I understand how to close high net worth clients, but how do you get them into the office knowing that they're one, busy and two, being pitched by other financial advisors? And then he so says, go again, forward. how do you get them? I, I would typically, I would take one or the other out to lunch or coffee or whatever. I would let them talk about themselves, try and schedule the appointment. It just, I, I didn't have any trouble doing that. A lot of times, like I said, depending on where they came from, if they came to a seminar, then I had disturbed them in the seminar. They scheduled appointments with me immediately afterwards. If they were a referral from a CPA or another, a lot of times another client, the other clients would go, oh my gosh, you have no idea how she saved us or the things that she brought up in our conversation. So. I just, it, when you know what to do, it's not hard to get them to come in because you disturb them. Sometimes business owners, I would go to their offices and disturb them there, but I always did require, I was not going to meet with anybody unless both people were there because men and women are disturbed by different things. Women want to protect the nest egg at all cost. Men that's why you never, ever meet alone with a guy and try and do this approach talk. Because if they're, most guys are like my husband, my husband's like, yeah, if I lost everything, mm, if as long as I have a 85 inch big screen TV and a futon, I'm good. A yeah. woman will never feel that way. So people, if you don't remember anything about this today, it is the female, if it is the women who are your potential prospects, they will either hire you or not hire you. They, they are the ultimate decision makers. So you think he's the one running the company. He feels invincible. There's nothing, if he loses it all, he can start another company. She feels vulnerable. She yeah. wants her ducks in a row and she's going to make sure he gets that done. Right? <laughs> well, this is so. folks, that, we're coming down to the, the topic of the hour. And a lot of the things that you guys are asking, like some of the stuff that Aaron's sharing is in my previous video, The Secret Sauce to Closing. Aaron shares a lot of nuggets there of what she's regurgitating right now. But so Aaron, these are often come up with high network clients. I, I, and there's three or four of them around credentials. I know you're a CFP. Does it really matter to you? No. no. Whether the high, do the high network clients even care? When, no. no, they don't care. <laughs> They don't, they, 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 they don't care. Your, your confidence comes from being able to point out risk on the weaknesses in what they have or haven't done on the risk side of the balance sheet. Matt, 
I closed 90% of my prospects without ever talking about my investment process. And because I disturbed them, this is a ride. Have you thought about this? Have you done this? Whatever. I disturbed them so much that they made this mental leap. Oh my God. If she's, if she, my attorney never talked to me about this. My CPA never talked to me about this. My real estate agent never talked to me about the titling of my second home. All these people that I think of my highest valued advisors, if she's that good and pointing out things that they miss, she must be really good at managing money. Really. Right. I was like, they just made this mental leap. So that's awesome. Here's, we talked about prospecting today, right? Having disturbing tracks, when to use them. You have 10 different avenues that you can go down to with seminars, out the lunch bunch, drop drive-bys, things like that. What? You and you compile the list that you talked about. You're calling your hot list. Sunday nights, you would go through your hot list. Mm -hmm. How important was that knowing and tracking who was on, on that hot list? It was critical. I mean, I do it today, Matt. I called Matt this week. Are we going to do another webinar? You have to know. I always had 20 hot. I had lots of not hot, but I would stay really focused on my hot prospects. Maybe that was figuring out okay, that woman that was in the business writer of the Dallas Morning News, by the way. After that article came out, my business went boom. It was just off the charts. So I was intentional. I want to start, I need some, I want to have hockey stick growth. Boy, if I could get an article written about me in Dallas Morning News, that would be awesome. So how do I get to her? So she was a pro hot prospect. It didn't happen overnight, but I wonder who knows her. What does she belong to? I had to, I ended up doing a walkathon for a charity event. I walked with a woman who I knew her. Right. So I was very intentional about mapping out where I wanted this to go by yeah. each person. I took me for, at, at one point, I ended up getting finally into Toyota. They moved to Plano, Texas. How do I get in to see the HR manager and have start doing seminars for the senior level executives of Toyota when everybody's rushing after them? Right. New company in town. I, I belong to a group and the HR manager of the group of Toyota was a member of my group. I befriended her, never talked about my business ever once. Took her out to lunch, guess what I did? I talked about her. Eventually, like I said, the, she got me in to do planning for the senior level executives of Toyota. Same thing with UPS, right? I, I knew who I needed to know to get where I wanted to go. No, yeah, that's that, that rhymes. That's pretty good, right? I know you got to write bike, Mike, write that down. <laughs> I knew yeah, that was right. pretty good. I like that one. <laughs> so that hot list was it was not just the folks that you, you were trying to go after. It was it built on a list that it's a flow chart of the prospects and friends and family. Yeah, I ended up working uh, with 280 of the most senior level executives from UPS. How yeah. did I get there? How did I do that? It started off as an idea. And then it morphed into something more than that. It's a lot more than that. Same thing well, with Toyota. So I love this question from one of my, actually, he's one of my friends that is getting into the business. And it's almost like for the advisors who are like thinking differently, right? They're like, oh, okay, I need a change of mindset. Because you have no idea how many advisors I ask, how many do you charge a planning fee? And 99% oh, of them say, no, I just right. don't feel right. I don't do it, blah, blah, blah. So this is a change of mindset. The advisors are probably like, how am I going to? It's almost like starting over if you think about it, right? So for those advisors looking to reset, if you will, and let's now move up market or the advisor that my buddy who's in his forties, he's starting a new career. He is extremely influential in his market, if you will. He knows everybody and everyone loves him, but he knows nothing about financial planning, but he wants to be an advisor. What would be your advice to him getting started? What do you think is going to be my advice? I would say you're probably going to go out to the influential people, take them to lunch, ask them questions, and then- I'm going to say, take my course. Jeez. Oh, no. Yeah. I didn't know that. He's already yeah. taking- By the way, he's already taking your course. Uh, he just <laughs> signed up. He just signed up. But he was like, you know what? Ask this question. because I And I think it's pertinent because it's good for the other advisors who are looking to reset. Yeah. That's the other thing, too, is if you know a lot of people, use that, right? Take them to lunch. And if they say, what are you doing these days? I just started a financial services business. Now, the hard thing about that, Delzi, is this, I ended up having a, I, I, had, I had a, a policy. I didn't do business with friends, family, or neighbors. So for your friend, if these people all know he's brand new to the business, that could be a negative. But what you do, what he could say, and again, it'd be nice to talk to him open personally, but 
I went, my, my next door neighbor, when I first started, was very wealthy, ran a company. I said, here's the deal. I'm going into this business, but I have a policy. I do not do, my policy is I will not do business with friends, family, or neighbors. What was great is your friends love you. They want to help you. And so they will start referring you to other people. They don't want you to screw up with their money, but they don't care because they look at you like you're brand new. You don't really know what you're doing, but they want to help you. And they'll, in so if you proactively state that you have that policy, say, I can't do business with you, Delzy, because we're friends, friends, family, or neighbors, but I would, I'd love for your introductions to people on a favorable basis that I could do business with. Oh my gosh, of course I want to help you. Da, 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 da. What's interesting then when you set out, I have this policy. I remember my rich neighbor came back to me, sold his company for half a billion dollars or whatever it was. And he came to me, he goes, Aaron, I, I've heard your policy over and over again. I'm asking you to um, make an exception for me. Okay. If that, what a different uh, vibe that is when they're asking you to make an exception to your policy. Okay, for you, I will. But if you proactively say, I have this policy, who do you know that could benefit from my services? Oh my gosh, let me introduce you to so-and-so. Because otherwise, when this guy, when he goes to his friends, they literally take their wallet and kind of hold their back pocket like, oh, I don't know, he's brand new to the business. And so that's just one thought I had. If he's already taking my course, he and I can have a discussion about that in our next live call. So. That's awesome. So folks, we're at the top of the hour. Let me make sure I got everything. Blake, Mike, have you uh, seen any more? No, um, I think they're all coming in pretty standard and we've answered most of them. Uh, did the yeah. hot list, did all the other things. So yeah, I think we're good. Just want to remind people, if you go to the AaronBotsford.com slash Bright House landing page. You can get a copy of her book. You can learn more about what's in the course. You can sign up and get the exclusive pricing. It is all there for you at AaronBotsford.com slash Bright House. Just try to make it easy. All right. Thanks, Blake. Thank you, Aaron. This was absolutely awesome as always again. So I'm already thinking about possibly having you back for a third call on what you would be doing with your clients if at all time highs and how you would be setting that up. That's pretty cool cool idea. So folks, thank you again for your time. I appreciate it. I know we've taken an hour. You're probably half asleep because of you just finished lunch and you're in a lunch coma. Until then, I thank all my counterparts, all my colleagues who've invited their guests as well. You make it a great rest of your day. And thank you to the, uh, the, the elite advisor team as always. Thanks, Aaron. Talk Bye -bye. to you soon. Bye.